This is Sasha Kerbler, uh, and he'll be talking about running Apache Beam on Kubernetes. Awesome. Thank you very much. So, big of a bigger introduction of myself. My name is Sasha. I'm currently a cloud space architect. Uh, joined Google in 2019 as a customer engineer in Austria, Vienna, and just recently moved to Munich, joined a great cloud space team there as an architect, where we are basically working uh, with our customers on designing and implementing solutions based on GCP products. As you have seen in the title, we are talking about Kubernetes today, um, but before doing so, uh, we wouldn't be able to work with Kubernetes if there aren't containers. So I just recently asked uh, Chatbot to give me a basic introduction of containers, and it basically said, Containers are a relatively new technology was basically the first sentence. I don't fully agree with that as in the early days of Unix, whenever CH root was introduced, it was the first sign of containers. But uh, in the year of 2013, whenever Docker was released, um, the containers become, became more accessible and it became the de facto st standard for how to package and deploy applications. And there are some benefits to it. As you see here down below, um, they are lightweight in the sense that in the graph on the right, you basically see you just package your libraries and applications into a container. And you can move them around, meaning wherever there's an environment to run container, either on your laptop, in the cloud, or in your data center, um, they, they are portable, meaning you can run the same configuration everywhere. They are, compared to virtual machines, they are way more efficient as they uh, don't have their own kernel. Each container basically shares, all the containers share, share the same kernel. And in terms of security, each of the containers runs completely isolated, meaning um, they are not able to access each other or interact with each other without permissions. Now, uh, let's talk about Kubernetes. Um, whenever those containers came up, it was awesome. Everyone was keen on running containers. They worked great on your own machine, but whenever you had uh, 50 servers and you wanted to run containers, it became pretty tough to keep track of those containers, whether they are running, um, what the state of those containers are. So we needed basically a solution to orchestrate all of those steps, and this is basically when Kubernetes came around. Uh, a colleague of mine had a pretty good analogy for, for Kubernetes. He, he compared it with a gardener in a plant nursery, where basically the gardener uh, takes care of planting new plants, uh, checking the health of the plants, watering plants. If there is more demand of a certain plant, it basically, the gardener plants new plants, plants, and this is exactly what Kubernetes does. Kubernetes um, schedules your containers, your workloads, uh, whenever we talk about Kubernetes, we most often talk about a cluster, meaning it's basically a quorum, quorum of servers connected together, um, which gives Kubernetes the, the ability to schedule well your workload wherever there is space for it. It keeps track of the health of the applications and also it can scale the, the instances of your applications automatically up and down. Um, to, to conclude the, the container and Kubernetes uh, part and talk about why, why they are created. On the one hand side, um, the, the artifacts that are produced in terms of Docker, for instance, we talk about images where each of the image is versioned and you can basically reproduce whenever there is an error based on a certain version number. And similar to the Kubernetes deployment artifacts, th those can be versioned as well. Containers provide the, the ability for central deployment, meaning wherever you have your Kubernetes cluster, you can deploy from, from your laptop, from a CI CD pipeline to one cluster, to 10 clusters, or to all of your clusters if they are located globally. Um, they, they are portable in the sense that, as I said before, you can run the same container or the same image on your workstation as well as in the cloud, which basically adds a lot of flexibility into the picture. 
Um, if you work cross teams with uh, containers, it basically adds the capability that you have one certain standard which everyone follows, which, which makes it easy for different teams to work together. And the last point is the simplification of debugging and testing as you can reproduce if there are errors. Debug uh, container code on your machine locally to try to get an understanding of what is happening within your applications. If we now switch to the view from Beam, um, whenever we talk about, about portability in Beam, there are basically two aspects to it. On the one hand side, there is the portability API, which provides a language neutral representation of your Beam pipeline, which basically gives you the, the capability of writing a Python Beam pipeline, for instance, and run it on the Flink operator. And on the other hand side, there is the runner API, which is basically a set of interfaces runners have to implement to be able to run a Beam pipeline. Currently, um, in Beam, Java, Python, and Go are supported. On, on the other hand, in terms of runners, there is Dataflow as a managed service, and then there is Spark, Flink, Nemo, Samza, or Twisted 2 as runners. So you basically have the opportunity to write your pipeline once and run it everywhere. And now, basically, if we look at the architecture and add Kubernetes into the picture of a Beam pipeline, you would add another layer into the picture, which would be Kubernetes based on the, the infrastructure, meaning those servers. You might ask yourself now, we do already have the portability aspects in Beam. Why would it make sense to, to add another abstraction layer? And it basically gives you a lot of flexibility. You can um, deploy your pipelines and everywhere where uh, Kubernetes is running, having Again, one standard running it everywhere. Um, it adds, especially containers, adds in terms of DevOps a lot, meaning you can automate your, your whole pipelines. Um, and also in terms of security, Kubernetes provides a lot of security controls in terms of access management, network policies, and so on. And the last point is the scalability aspect where you basically uh, Kubernetes can take care of the scaling aspect, meaning if, they are, if you have a real-time uh, pipeline that has certain spikes, it can automatically scale up your containers and scale them down whenever they are not needed anymore. What options uh, do we have on Kubernetes? Um, on the one hand side, I, there are the Kubernetes native uh, approaches, which is basically, which are basically workflow management tools that have been purposely built for Kubernetes, um, such as Argo, for instance. You could run your your pipeline as a container, or each step of your pipeline as a container, and chain them together however you want. And on the other hand side, there are the data analytics native, I call them, which is basically Spark or Flink that already exist and were brought up. To, to Kubernetes and provide you the capability to run your pipelines on Kubernetes. There, I've prepared a, a demo, which is most probably the main part of, of the presentation, uh, with the goal, as I saw, there are a lot of more Kubernetes Flink talks afterwards, with uh, the basic goal to run a, an Apache Beam word count on a Kubernetes cluster leveraging the, the Flink operator. Operators in Kubernetes are a pattern basically that extend the existing Kubernetes API and provide the capability to automate the management of Kubernetes resources. In terms of our application, uh, we do have certain requirements. On the one hand side, we need something to execute, uh, a char file. Uh, so I decided to use a char file uh, to run it as a Java application. We need a Docker container. Then obviously we need to run Kubernetes somewhere to be able to run a Kubernetes pipeline. Um, then we need a Kubernetes deployment and at the end a Flink cluster which basically takes care of the running of the Beam application. Um, on the right here you see a graph of 
how such an operator and especially the Flink operator works. Um, the Flink operator has its own resources called Flink deployments. Um, and whenever you, as a user, submit those Flink deployments, you apply them to the Kubernetes API. You basically say to the Kubernetes API, hey, I got a new job, please take care of it. What the Kubernetes API then does is, with the Flink deployment, it recognizes, okay, uh, it's not me, it's the Flink operator that should take care of it. So it hands over the, the deployment to the Flink operator, and the Flink operator then deploys um, the application for you into a cluster, uh, and the operator itself keeps then also track and monitors the, the whole cluster for you. I'll just head over to the demo right now. So what we, what we have here is basically a main class, um, which is our Beam pipeline. It's the word count pipeline, which in the end has a main class that parses the pipeline options and starts the process of running the word count. So first step is we pro input is, is a file. So basically it starts reading uh, the lines of the file. It starts counting the, the words then formats those counts into a readable format, and at the end it writes those counts again into a text file. Whenever we want to create an executable for that, we have to run, in that case it's Maven, you can also use Gradle basically to, to package the application into an executable. Um, whenever this is done, you will end up with a target directory where all your executables are stored. In our case, we will focus on the word count beam bundle jar here, um, which we will use to run our pipeline. So the next step is then, uh, so first off, our step is done. We do have an execu executable. Now we need a Docker container. Um, Docker containers are described or created uh, with a so-called Docker file. Uh, where you basically have a description of what the, the, the Docker image and then the container should look like. In that case, it's just a three-liner where we basically have a base image, which is the already existing Flink image in version 115. And additionally, I'm basically just creating a directory and copying the executable into that directory. Once that is done, so let me just switch over to the terminal. I can basically uh, create an image with the following command. I, I tell Docker, uh, start building my image, give the image a name, it's called Flink with artifacts and a version tag, and at the end you have your directory where the Docker file is located. Running that, it should be done in a few seconds since I already built that and Docker recognized that all the steps in the, in the file can be taken from the cache and then we can run Docker images um, where we see that the first one is the artifact that we just tried to build, which I already built five days ago um, with the name and the version tag. So the next step is great, we have our Docker container, now we need to run it on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, for that, we have to write a so-called deployment YAML file, which is basically the Flink deployment we just saw in, in the picture on the presentation, and it looks like the following. You specify again a name there, you specify an image, so we are referring to the image we have just built before, with the version, we specify, specify the Flink version. Additionally, we can provide resource uh, requirements for certain um, subcontainers. In that case, it's the job manager and task manager of Flink, which get uh, memory and CPU. And at the end, we have the job area, which is basically where we specify our uh, own configuration for, the, for our application. We have a char URI in, at first, which is basically locating the, the executable we have copied to the Docker image. We can specify a parallelism, which is, in our case, it's two. 
we have appointed to the main class of the executable. And then additionally, we have some arguments that we are passing on to, to the beam pipeline, which is basically the, the runner type and the, the output directory. Um, whenever we want to deploy that to the Kubernetes cluster, um, it's, it's kubectl apply, uh, and basically then the link to the file that we want to deploy. And once we execute that, we see that the deployment has been created. And whenever we go to the Kubernetes cluster and look for the running containers, we see on the one hand side that there is a Flink Kubernetes operator running, and then there's our beam example which is running. Um, one of the additional benefits is whenever you deploy such, a, such an application, you also receive uh, a beam example REST endpoint, which is the Flink UI, which we are able to open and and basically see um, the Flink dashboard and are able, uh, if we go to running jobs, it should be empty, right? Uh, the reason is our job has already completed. It just took 12 seconds to, to run the word count example. And we can see the details of the, jobs here, of the job here as well, where we are able to understand basically the, the different steps that have been executed, um, how many bytes were the input on how many bytes were output and also in terms of records. That, that's a basic example of how, how such a pipeline could look like with Kubernetes in the picture. But to, to close off the presentation, uh, I just prepared that sentence. Um, be careful and think twice. So uh, it's cool uh, to use Kubernetes with your pipelines, but whenever you use Kubernetes, um, it adds another layer of complexity, basically. You have to tra track the health, again, of the Kubernetes cluster. You have to install the Flink operator there. And I would say if you, for instance, have the decision to do whether you run a, a Beam pipeline on Dataflow or in GCP or on Cheeky, I would definitely go for a managed service as it completely removes the, the management aspects of it. Thank you very much. Any questions?